Thank you. Good morning. Welcome back to day two of Forest Asia. It was a fantastic day yesterday. We had 2,000 people here. We had, as we just heard, 3,000 more online. We had 4,000 tweets and 2 million people um, possibly reached by that. And not only did we have a very inspiring youth session, we also had 12 countries represented at ministerial level, and we had the president of the Republic of Indonesia um, uh, with us. That was a very exciting day, and I'm looking forward to continue that today. What I want to do now is, is to briefly give you some quotes from yesterday. I will then make an announcement and then look forward to today's uh, deliberations. Some things we heard yesterday was that President Yuriono talked about governments in Southeast Asia continuing to develop regional strategies on adaptive capacities and low carbon economies. He also urged businesses across the ASEAN region to commit to sustainable land use and investment practices. We listened to the Minister of Environment and Water Resources from Singapore, Vivian Balakrishnan, who talked about unsustainable expansion and poor governance as, as key problems that we have to deal with. I would like to recall Pavan Sudkev, who moderated our first plenary panel. Um, he, talked, he asked the question, how do we move from perverse incentives such as fossil fuel subsidies to much needed positive incentives like finance for smallholders and communities. We also heard, um, I also have a quote from Mark Burroughs, who we, we will hear more about to, from today, and he said, there's $23 trillion out there looking for a home. Doesn't sound too difficult to, to find. Um, but, and, the, and, and these funds can redefine how we approach sustainable development. Now, take, compare that with the aspirations of a green, green climate fund um, of $0.1 trillion per year. So it's interesting to, to, to think about the potentials here. So those were some quotes from yesterday. Before I turn to day two, I want to make an announcement. It's actually a little launch uh, that I would do here from the podium, and that is, has to do with one of the objectives of this conference, which is commitments to research. Now, research is done to answer questions. Um, but we need to be careful about what those questions are. Otherwise, we may end up with lots of answers to questions that are not relevant, or maybe even questions we don't really know. Um, and of course, conferences like this, negotiation processes, and other fora are very important to define those questions. But we think that this is not enough. We also need to reach out more broadly to the public, use modern technologies, and offer the opportunity to formulate those research questions on forestry, on landscapes, on sustainable land use that we are discussing. So to do that, we are now building on our initiative that we call evidence-based forestry. And within that initiative, we are launching a call for the 20 most important questions in forestry, 20 questions that need research. And I don't have any PowerPoint, fortunately, but I will show you how to find this 20 questions website. And to do that, we actually made up an acronym, a new acronym that you have never seen before. It looks like this. Is that coming on the screen? It is T20Q, the 20 most important questions in forestry. Google that, follow the instructions, and we look forward to yours and many, many others suggestions to the most important questions in forestry. That was my announcement. And I, I, can, I can hand this out later if you didn't, uh, uh, if, you, if you need to, if you couldn't memorize it. Now, day two. Today, we're going to dig a little bit deeper in some of the key questions. We will look at climate change. What are the impacts? What are the possibilities to deal with climate change? We will have uh, Dr. Pachauri from the IPCC 
deliver a keynote. And second, we will look at how do we mobilize finance for smarter land uses, and we will have Mark Burroughs tell us more about that. Uh, we will also have five themes that will, as was announced by, by, my, uh, by the speaker before me, five themes of the conference that each will have a high-level panel. These themes are governance, sustainable investments, climate change, landscapes for food and biodiversity, and communities and equitable development. Five themes. These will tie together the topics that we have dealt with so far and lead us towards a closing plenary at the end of today. That's what's going to happen today. It's great to see you all here again. And I will now leave to uh, our MC to announce the prominent speakers in this session. Um, I'll leave that to you, actually. But I know that we have some very prominent speakers coming up just now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Peter Holmgren. It is an honor to welcome His Excellency, Minister Manuel Pugal Veda, Minister of Environment, Peru. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much. I feel pleased and very honored to be here with you in this Forest Summit, Asia. Let me say that after I've heard the numbers of 2,000 people here, 3,000 more in live, live, live stream, and I don't remember how many people through tweets, I'm completely afraid. But I will try to make my reflections around the topic of forest, climate change, the climate debate, the debate of development, and the COP20. So I'm going to move around these four topics. And let me say that we are in a special time. We are in a time in which we should take decisions. We are, we are in a time in which, through these kind of sessions, we are building momentum. We are building momentum because we are short on time to take decisions. And we have a goal. We need to have, by the end of the next year, an agreement. A new agreement that deals with the climate change consequences, that can bring to the new generations hope, that can bring new kind of measures to deal and to address the consequence of the climate change. So let me give this speech, this plenary speech, talking around seven or around seven questions or seven topics, seven items. The first one, the climate debate as a development dialogue. And the question is how much do the forest is already part of the development debate? We are in a time in which in many countries, even in the developed countries, we are living economic, finance, and ideological crisis. We are in a time in which we are discussing new ways to orient our development, the word development. So this is the time in which we can raise topics or issues of sustainable development. The topic of sustainable development has been developed by around 25 years. It was in 1987 that through our common future, the report raised the topic of sustainable development. 20 years after that, this is the momentum of that topic. This is the time in which we can, through that focus, through that topic, we can develop new ideas, new visions, new ways to orient our development in many of our countries. So how much the forest it is part of that? I think that not too much or not too enough. So how can we move to that? In the UN system, there is a debate of the post-2015 ODMs or new ODMs. And as part of the ODMs, we are discussing the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So what it is important is try to identify how much the forest should be part of that discussion. What are the kind 
what kind of indicators we need to include in the SDG debate to be part of what we are going to measure in the future. How much we can bring the forest to this discussion and how much we are building in that debate that kind of considerations. Also, in this debate of development, we are talking about green economy. And what does it mean, the green economy? means that we are going to rethink the way in which we are measuring our growing. We need to include into the GDP more nature consideration. We need to include in the GDP the natural infrastructure issue. And we need to develop our economy with low carbon emissions. So the forest plays a very important role in that green economy discussion. And many of our countries are currently discussing the green economy or the green growing because as it has been a mandate of the Rio Plus 20 document, the future we want, every country based on its own reality needs to create the basis for the green economy policy. Many countries in Latin America, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, has already developed the green economy policy. Peru is working on that. But we need to include more forestry consideration into the green economy. Mostly, mostly based on what it is a reality. The reality is that in many of our countries in Latin America, the, the bigger, biggest source of greenhouse emission, it is deforestation and land use change. So if we want to have a very clear policy to deal with that problem, we need to include in our green economy discussion the consideration of the forest. And also, we have this discussion of the TIP, the economic of ecosystem and biodiversity, in which we should recognize that for the development we don't need only artificial or, 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 or human infrastructure. What we need to consider it is the natural infrastructure. How can we consider as part of the policies to creating growth in our countries the natural infrastructure? So what I think is that we need to put closer the forestry discussion in all this big debate. The post-2015 debate, the SDGs, the TIP, the green economy, among many others. So it is a very big challenge and it should be our goal to bring the forest to this discussion. This is my first point. My second point it is, what is the situation of the climate debate now? And let me say that we have already developed the diagnosis. Probably Dr. Pachauri is going to say us what has the IPCC has already identified. We know that the current trend is moving us over the two degrees threshold. And we know what are the consequences of that, or what will be the consequences of that. We have already identified the objective. We need a new agreement. We need an agreement that can deal or can address that problem. We need to take into consideration that everybody has responsibility on this issue. We also have received the mandates. We are close to be 20, more than 20 years discussing the climate change topic. Since 92, we are close to celebrating the COP20. And we are putting as a goal to have in the 21st COP an agreement. And we recognize that there are some milestones to fulfill with that mandate and to reach the objective to have that agreement. We have the next bond meeting in June. We have the September, the uh, Secretary General Summit in September. We have the COP20 in Lima in December. We have the COP21 in Paris. So if that is as clear as I'm describing why we are not taking decisions, what is failing, why we are still thinking that we are in the same road that we had uh, had in Copenhagen. How can we change that? And for me, there are some important topics that, or issues that can deal with that situation. First, we need to integrate the discussion. Currently, we are discussing finance in an isolated way, rent, mitigation, 
adaptation, but we are not integrating the discussion to try to bring solution. Second, we should be very clear that we are not going to repeat Kyoto. Kyoto had their time, and now we are going to have a bottom-up agreement in which everybody can recognize their own responsibilities. Everybody needs to take measures. Everybody needs to take domestic actions. So it's not going to be as it had been Kyoto. We are going to have a different kind of an agreement. Third, what we need to recognize is that there are many actors, different sectors, and different countries that are doing things. And that countries, and that sectors, and that actors are seeking for recognition. We need to recognize the role of the business sector. We need to recognize the rights of indigenous peoples. We need to recognize what civil society is currently doing. And it's very difficult to bring what it is already done into an agreement, but that is a challenge. What we need to put in the agreement is stories, success stories. The business sector is trying to say to us, please recognize that things are moving. We are not in a year zero. We are in a time in which the business sector and different actors are bringing solutions, and also the forestry sector. And also, we can recognize that the only way to bring solutions is through recognizing the realities, the different realities. So we need to reinterpret the CBDR, common but different responsibilities. We need to, to, to recognize that we should include that principle, but in a new way, in a new way in which everybody has their own responsibility. So that is important in the current climate debate. Let me move to the third, my third reflection, the forestry issue. For me, the forestry topic, it is still the younger brother of the climate debate, because the forest consideration in the climate debate has been developed mostly as a mechanism, not as an objective. So how can we bring the forestry as an objective? So let me, in this third point, moving from the domestic reality to the international debate. First, we need to strengthen in policies, forestry policies. And in that sense, what we need to create is competitiveness around the forest. We need to create conditions to have competitiveness around the forestry sector. Secondly, second, for that, we need to have enough information. We need to monitor our forest, the reality, the quality, the health of our forest. Also, we need to solve the land use problem. And the land use problem, it is related to incentive. It is related to this big discussion of property rights, concessions, tenures, and many other topics. And fourthly, what we need is to deal with the decentralization processes in many countries. In countries as in Peru, the contradiction between the national policies and the regional policies is creating a lot of conflict. So what we need to do is to recognize that probably in the local sector it's going to take better decisions but framed by a national policies. And we need to create the conditions to fit both of them. Decentralization it is part, it is an important part of the discussions around policy. My second point it is rights, titling and tenure around this idea to strengthening the forestry sector. And around of that, what we need to recognize is rights of settlers and mostly of indigenous peoples. Taking into consideration that currently, because the forestry markets of carbon, people are losing trust and confidence around that mechanism. People are thinking that that can uh, create conditions to lose their lands, that that are not recog uh, recognizing the rights over the land and over the forest. So as part of the safeguards that we need to develop, we should recognize that right of the people who live there. Also, we need to create ways to solve conflicts. 
because there are a lot of conflict over the forest. Not only because rights, but also because economic activities. When we live in countries as in Peru or, the, or in the Amazon basin, in which currently the new big threat it is the illegal mining that is creating destruction of the forest, what we need to do is to create conditions to solve that, over, that conflict based on the overlap of different rights for oil, for mining, for forests, for tourism, among many others. And in that sense, the landscape focus can help a lot. Also, we need to revise our legal system because when we try to develop forest based on our legal system, we will find a lot of problems. We need to create some new ways for the good management of the forest. But we need to go deeply in the legal system discussion as part of what we need to do to create that good management. And finally, what we need to create is rules, enforceable rules. We need to have ways to enforce the rules because part of the problem regarding rights, titling, and tenure, it is the lack of enforcement of the rule. My third point in this three reflect, uh, third reflection, it is around the incentive. How can we bring the private sector, the business sector, to manage the forest? What kind of incentive can we create to bring the business sector to the forest? How much this initiative of Unilever is a good example of how the private sector can play a more active role regarding the forest. How much this initiative of this oil palm uh, company in Indonesia or in Malaysia, sorry, I don't remember, can help to look at new ways to bring the business sector into the forest. But on the other hand, regarding incentive, what we need to do is to address the problem of the value of the carbon bonds around the forest. The current price are creating lack of interest. The current price of the bonds of the carbon is creating this incentive to have the business sector and the investor more close to, try to, to the forestry sector. And we need to recognize and use the consumers to have the companies using the supply chain as part of what it is the solution to protect the forest as a landscape. So, and finally, regarding the incentive, what we need to do is to try to put together all the pieces. Country as in Peru has a lot of projects, a lot of initiatives, but we are not looking at that as a big or as a one piece project or program. We are looking the forest in an isolated way. We are looking the forest just through projects, through program, through cooperation. But what we need to create is good conditions, and in that sense, what we are doing, fulfilling the mandate of Warsaw, to prepare the national contribution can help a lot. My fourth reflection is, how much can we build based on mandate toward an agreement? As you know, Warsaw had as an advantage that solved many of the discussions around red. Not everything, but some of the discussion has been already addressed and has been already solved. So we have some mandates, but we need to go deeply to some points. First, how can we bring the forestry discussion into the, fin the finance discussion. So how can we build through this mandate of results-based finance in a realistic way? What are the measures that we are going to take to fulfill with the results-based finance to have a fit between our goals and the money? Because there are a lot of untrust between who are going to put the money and who should do the homework. So what we need is to create some kind of indicator. What does really it mean results-based finance? How can we fit the finance with what it is our own objective? And for that also, it is obviously very important, the capitalization of the Green Climate Fund. 
But the capitalization of the ECF is going to be a political signal, but it is not going to be enough. It's going to, be to, to bring more trust in this discussion, but it's not going to be enough. And in the final discussion, the big debate, it is what we are going to count, just public and public new funds, or just the typical fund for the uh, assistance for development, or we are going to, uh, to count private resources, or how much the public funds can create leverage to private funds, how much the new bonds market can bring more money to deal with what we need to do. So that is one important point, bring the forest closer to the financial discussion. The second point, it is and a mandate, it is also a mandate, we need to identify locally the focal points, the focal entities. Who is going to play that role? And probably what we are going to have in many, of our, uh, many countries, it is the discussion between finance minister, agriculture ministers, environmental ministers, among many others. So how can we build new entities? How can we build new ways to coordinate among these different entities? We need to have a very strong focal point. But for that, we need to think in a new way to create good conditions to have a very strong focal point in, in that sense. Also, one mandate is to create a national forest monitoring system. But for that, we need to have our own methodologies. In the world, there are a lot of different methodologies. There are competence between the different sectors, companies, universities that are used to offering different kinds of methodologies to monitoring the forest. But the challenge of the countries is to try to receive that, but based on that, to build their own methodology to monitoring their forest. Because when we see in many countries the different kinds of methodologies, the critics of one to the other, we recognize that we need to create our own based on that experience, but it is important to have a very trustable system to monitoring the forest. And finally, there is a mandate to work around drivers of deforestation. And drivers of deforestation means to understand the forest as a landscape. That is what C4 is currently doing, is look the forest as an ecosystem. Look the reality of forest not only around the tree, but around the people, around the landscape, around the, uh, the reality, around the agriculture, uh, uh, agricultural issues. It's bringing all the discussion to try to identify drivers of deforestation. My fifth reflection, it is around the securities. And let me say the importance that the Global Canopy, Canopy Group document has in this discussion. It is about securities on the Amazon because climate change. When we talk about securities in this case, and this is a very important document, we are talking about water security, energy security, food security, and health security. And when we discuss the security around the tropical forest, we are able to bring new actors, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Agriculture, different actors that are not necessarily working in the topic. So it is a way not only to recognize what would be the consequences of the climate change over the tropical forest, but it is the way to create links between the different sectors and the different actors. So the topic of securities surely could be a good way to move this discussion and to raise it in our local and economic consideration. I think that the securities, it is an important way to create more awareness of the role of the forest. My sixth point, it is what it is really a suggestion. I, know I don't have the answer, but if we have into consideration that we are talking about the SDG, why, and I give to C4 that challenge, we don't discuss an FDG, Forestry Development Goals. What do we want to measure? What kind of indicators do we want to include in this discussion? What do we think are clearly 
the indicators are going to show us that we are improving our manage, the management of our forest. I think that we are on the time in which we can do that. We can develop an FDG. Let me tell you what happened to me some weeks ago. We were discussing with the business sector in Peru around a campaign that we are developing as part of the COP20. And one of the guys who was there told us, when we discussed about growing or the economic performance of a country, it is very clear the indicators. GDP, excuse me that I don't, so, I don't know how can I say in, in English, balanza de pagos, and two or three indicators. When we talk about the social se uh, sector, we are used to, say, to, to talking around the line of poverty, nutrition, among others. But when we talk about environment, or when we talk about forests, we really don't know exactly what we need to show, what we need to measure, what we need to prove. So it is important to have indicators. And probably try to have FDGs, it could be a good way to move forward in this discussion. So because I'm taking too much time, let me move to my last reflection. Really, let me say what we are doing as part of the organization of the COP20, what we are doing as the next host country of the COP20. First, let me say that we are very confident. We, have, we, we, are, we know that we are able to do something. We know that we are able to move this discussion toward an agreement. We know that it is a big challenge, it is difficult, it's complex, but based on the Latin America position, but also based in the partnership with countries as the Southeast Asia countries, we can do something. And for that, what is clear is that we need to have an output. And for Lima, the output should be, must be, to have a very strong draft agreement to be signed in Paris. And for that, we need to move in the formal process recognizing the role of the ADP, but also in the non-formal process. So we can take advantage of the September summit that wants to bring political will to the negotiation process, try to bring the leaders of the world to offer and put on the table what they are able to offer to the world. So we have that, the ADP, we have the September summit, we have meetings as this, in which we are discussing the forest sector. So based on that, we can deal with our objective to reach an ag a draft agreement by the end of December. But that is not the only objective that we are seeking. The second ob objective, it is trying to bring some content to adaptation. We are used to talking about adaptation, but not necessarily with a clear content. What does it mean resilience in adaptation? What are the roles of the forest in adaptation? What it is our agenda as developing country to recognize what does adaptation mean? And how much we can put the adaptation discussion into national contribution and into the final agreement. So that is our second goal. And for that, we have received a mandate. We need to revise the guidelines that are the base for the National Adaptation Plans, NAPS. So that is one of our missions. The third objective is trying to move the finance discussion into an improvement, into uh, some results. And as I've already told to you, the capitalization of the Green Climate Fund, it is important. And for that also, our fourth mandate is to bring information that is going to be part of the national determined contribution. And we think that the balance between finance and national, the, the NDCs, is a good way to create trust, to have developed countries putting money on the table and to have developing countries identifying their own action, not only for mitigation, but also for adaptation. We are ready to organize the COP. We are moving quickly, we are doing what are, or we're doing our biggest effort 
to have the countries on the table taking decisions by the end of this year. So let me finish saying again how pleased I am to be here, how pleased I am that even though this is a discussion around forests in Southeast Asia, I think it is very important to have this region of the world as part of a discussion to try to raise the forest discussion and to not continue to be the younger brother of the debate. We need to have political decisions, political solutions to the forest as part not only of the climate debate, but the development debate. Thank you very much.